Hey everybody, I'm back, and today we're going to talk about macro photography. I was out this weekend shooting macro photography with a workshop run by the Pennsylvania Center for Photography and Henry Rowan. And it was a fantastic workshop, very small group, there's only five or six of us, and Henry is a phenomenal photographer, super, super talented guy. For any of my uh, viewers who happen to be Pennsylvania photographers or South Jersey or Delaware, I would highly recommend checking out the Pennsylvania Center for Photography in Doylestown. He's a, a brilliant guy and, and very, very artistic. He's a very different type of photographer than I am. I'm kind of a technician and a gear guy and I, I, I am going for the sharpest focus and the most accurate representation of what I see. Henry lives in a very artistic world of creativity and compositing fantastic images together and, and just a completely different kind of of art creation than what I do and it's really preciously valuable to get out with people with that vision and and with a completely different approach and outlook of from yourself and learn from them and I did I learned a ton and so while I was there a number of people were asking about the different pieces of equipment that I use and I thought it would be worth just going through a quick little rundown of what each thing does why I use it what it's for there is actually one piece of equipment I forgot to bring with me to the uh, to the studio today, which are my extension tubes. So I will discuss them. It's really, there isn't technologically much there. Um, it's just a tube. So once I get to that point, I'll, I'll run through that. Unfortunately, I don't have one of them here to pop on there just to show. So first of all, I'm gonna just start from the bottom up and the legs that I use are the FLM CP30 L3 Pro legs. The reason that I chose these legs amongst a whole ton of different ones is essentially they're incredibly sturdy, they're incredibly well built, the, the um, twist knobs are really, really good and the, the, the tightness of the legs is really stable and secure and really good, but it's not quite the crazy price point of a Really Right Stuff or a Gitzo. Uh, and I review both Gitzo and Really Right Stuff. They're phenomenal. I'm not, they're absolutely nothing taken away from them at all. They're great. And, but I think FLM gets you there and it gets you there a little cheaper. And so uh, I made that decision, oh gosh, at least a little over a year ago and I've never regretted it for a minute. They're great stuff. Normally, I also shoot on an FLM ball head, but for macro photography, I go the color coordinated route. Um, I actually have the Classic Ball 5 from Novaflex, and this is the Novaflex Castle Cross uh, focusing rails. So, a little bit of time spent on each one. Let's talk about the ball head first. The reasons that I use it, first of all, I don't have to take the quick release plate off of my other ball head. It's actually probably the most ridiculous form of laziness, but I just swap it out so that I don't have to take the QR plate off and get the little Allen wrenches and do anything of this. I just never even put a QR plate on this ball head. It just sits with my, my focusing rails. Um, from an operational standpoint, I absolutely love the ease of use and how well built and how reliable it is. This is your panning knob and when you loosen it, it just pans like any tripod uh, ball head would. And then over here, you have this little toggle switch and this toggle switch once it's loose you have your free control of your your camera one of the things I love about the Novaflex ball head is the fact that you have a cutout here you have a cutout here and you have a cutout here so you have a tremendous amount of flexibility in terms of of how you're going to approach a shot and what where you can have these drop downs a lot of ball heads will only have one of those some have two very few have three and and i do like that and and um i use it non-stop then the other thing that i love about it is this blue ring around the middle is how you control the tension on the ball head inside the the seat so if i have this set i'm going to try to do this while i'm facing away from myself which is a little awkward and scary but um so at the setting of five I'll tighten that down it moves around just right it 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 supports the entire weight of, of, of my rig, but it doesn't like flop loose. You just rotate this over to the different tension levels, and I guess I'm going this way, and the lowest tension level, it just is obviously nowhere near enough tension to support such a heavy 
amount of gear on top. So I love the fact that it adjusts so quickly and easily around to each thing. All right, I'm just gonna rotate this back so that it's kind of facing more of a normal direction. And let's take a second to talk about this, this castle cross focusing rails. So one of the techniques that I use a lot in macro photography is focus stacking. And for anybody who's not into focus stacking yet or isn't entirely familiar with it, it's a whole lot easier and a lot less complicated than it initially sounds. But what you're doing, so when you're doing macro photography, your depth of field is tiny. You have just the slightest little sliver that's actually going to be in focus. And in many cases, that can create a really cool abstract photo. But in other cases, it actually, you want more things in focus. You have like just a sliver of a flower in focus, you'd like to see the whole thing in focus. So in order to achieve a macro photo that has more things in focus, you need to take a number of different shots and then merge them together afterwards in a software program. I use Photoshop, there are others, and I'm assuming there probably are others that do focus stacking better than Photoshop. Uh, I did a number of focus stacked images last weekend at the macro workshop, and while many of them worked beautifully, and I am really excited with the results of a few, there also were a couple that when I would let uh, Photoshop control the focus stacking, it was missing. There was a couple of spots where I would have like a stamen in the flower absolutely brilliantly in focus in one image, and the next image it would be blurrier, and the algorithm that Photoshop ran actually didn't catch it. It used the blurry version rather than the sharp version. And to be honest, I've done a fair amount of focus stacking before, and I've never really been too grumpy about what Photoshop has given me. On a couple of the images this time around, I, I was. I wasn't thrilled. Now, the next step is to go through and manually adjust which part of which picture is showing. And that's not incredibly hard. You have to go through and manually go into each mask and you need to mask out the blurry part of photo A and put mask in the sharp part of photo B and make sure that everything is kind of feathered nicely so that it all blends together and you can't tell. Um, but I am a little bit, I will confess to being lazy on the post-processing side of photography. I like to, take photos out in the field and use my camera 90 times more than I like spending time on the computer really tweaking it and making it look the way I want. And I think it's probably a, a knowledge level thing. And as I evolve and as I continue to progress, I'm sure that that will even out. But for right now, rather than go through and, and mess with that focus stacking and redo it all manually, I just scrapped it and <laughs> chucked it and put it in the trash bin and went on to the next focus stack. And, and the others, the ones that came out well, came out beautiful. So I'll, I'll drop a bunch of those into this video while I'm, I'm talking behind it so that you can see some of them. I'll also include the EXIF data. Um, and the program that I'm using for that, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. I just discovered that this week too. And it's a photographer uh, put it up and I'll, I'll link his name. I can't remember it right now. But basically it's a script to put the EXIF data, the title of your photo and your signature at, in a, a virtual mat around your picture for sharing. And I love it because it gives you the opportunity to put your EXIF data right on something that you're going to share for education purposes. I was chatting with a couple of friends and they're, we kind of all agreed that it wouldn't necessarily be the way to share in all forms of social media. But for those of us that like to help other photographers and like to share our settings so that people can see what we did, it's a really cool tool. So check it out. It's a free download. doesn't cost you a thing. And it, it's once you install it as a script to run through Photoshop, it's a piece um, of cake. The focusing rails, you can get away with just one. And basically what you would do, and I'll actually take one of these off. Let me just remove this and set this aside for a second. So imagine that your camera is set up on here. Basically, if you're taking a picture of a flower that's here, you would take your shot and then you just twist this a tiny little bit and every little bit ahead. You're moving the camera closer to the to the flower and so a different element is in focus. And you could do this 
and some of mine I did it a dozen times. There are times I've done focus stacks where there are 30 or 40 images, uh, even sometimes just three or four, just getting different spots that you want to have in focus can really make a difference. And I, I guess you probably can't see on the top. There is a scale here so that you can see the distance that you are from your subject. And by putting two of them together, you're just basically giving yourself both axes. You're giving yourself front to back and you're giving yourself uh, left to right. And so, I get this tightened in here, make sure it's secure. So I can move one direction or I can move the other direction and basically zone in on exactly what I want to focus. And as I mentioned, the other thing that I didn't remember to bring is extension tubes. So extension tubes are really cool because they, they change a couple of things. The, the one thing they change is magnification. They're going to give you a bigger magnification on your, your lens, which is fantastic. But the other thing that's really helpful is it controls or it shortens your minimum focusing distance. So on this lens, this is a 100 millimeter Canon uh, macro lens. So, so that is actually designed for really close focusing. On a, I use my 70 to 200 for some of the photos, and even though it's a 70 to 200 telephoto lens, with the uh, extension tubes in there, it switches it around, it increases the uh, magnification factor, but it also decreases the focus distance, so you can really, really appreciate um, um, using that to, to focus in on flowers that are much closer. And some of my macro flower images from the weekend that you would think for sure were taken with a, a 100 macro, uh, were actually taken with a 200 millimeter macro from further away and just with extension tubes. The other lens that I used this weekend was a rented lens. I, I heard about it from Henry. I wasn't even familiar with this lens before I went to his, we did like a pre-workshop where he went through and explained what we were going to be doing and what we were going to be looking at and whatnot. And he mentioned a Canon lens, the MPE 65 millimeter. And it turned out that one of the local camera shops, Alan's camera in Fairless Hills, for anybody who's a Fronos photo uh, fan, you've heard, uh, you've heard Jared mention a million and one times about Alan's camera. It's a great place, a phenomenal camera shop. Anybody in the Philly area, you need to go check it out if you haven't been there. Anyway, I went over there, they had a used one, so they let me rent it for the weekend for 45 bucks, which is, you can't beat it. And, and it was really cool. The one thing that prevented me from buying that lens was the fact that it, it is not usable as anything but a macro lens. There's no focusing to it. It literally will go from one time magnification to five times. And when you turn the, what would normally be a focusing ring, it actually runs an extension tube that's built right into the lens and it gets out closer to your flower and further away. And that five time magnification, I'll put a photo in of a spider that I took. The spider is actually the size of a flea and it's on a piece of grass. And, and it, I basically got right up against it with, with that. I was trying to photo focus stack the spider. And unfortunately, the spider was not cooperating with that idea. He was moving around like a jittery little beast. So I, I only got individual shots of him. One of them was usably in focus. It's not perfect. I don't have his eyes. I, I, it, it's, I'm sure people that do spider and bug macro photography will look at it and say, well, that's just total crap. Um, for me, it's kind of the, it was cool. I was, I was playing with a lens that I'd never used before and, and I got him. So I felt like a little surge of adrenaline for a victory. So that lens, unfortunately, it's a little over a thousand dollars new and the used one was $8.99. And when I was kind of figuring out like from a business standpoint, if it made sense to buy, for me it didn't because my business model as a photographer is really around portraiture and weddings and, and events. I do performing arts like concert stuff. So all of that stuff is pictures of people. And, and unless I wanted like a, a close up of, of like a, just a fragment of somebody's eyeball, there, there's no purpose for that macro lens in, in portraiture. You, there's no dual use. The 100 macro actually works out really nicely as a portrait lens. It, it doesn't limit you only to things up close. It just happens to have that capability. Um, 
this 65 MPE 65 is uh, is the opposite. It, it has no flexibility in what it can do. It's phenomenal for what it does, um, but then that's the tool that it it is, and that's there isn't another thing. So if you are really into macro photography and you shoot Canon, you definitely should check one of those out. It's it's a really really cool experience to shoot with. I will certainly rent one again if I'm going to do some more macro photography out somewhere and and I can get my hands on one. It, it was a cool lens, but will it pay for itself? Not until I start selling my macro photos of my flowers, and and I haven't ever done that. So so we'll have to see. If I sell some photos of the flowers, then uh, I can rethink it. So yeah, that's basically it. Uh